I've never seen a fire that didn't consume imperfections and impurity. I mean, go get twigs, branches, and junk and throw it in a fire, and what happens? It's, It's burned away. Go throw gold in a fire, what happens? The junk and the dross is what they call it, is burned away. You know, but the problem is the church, I don't know about you, but we come, we try to hide our imperfections. When actually this song is saying, Lord, burn like a fire in me. And I'm sitting there saying, I'd like to burn like a fire and consume some things in people's lives. But we're so busy trying to hide our imperfections and be fake. We're trying to have Facebook church. (laughs) You know, I don't know about you guys, but I've never gone and posted on Facebook, had a lousy day. And um, man, things stink. I'm really tempted to want to go punch someone. I've never posted that on Facebook. Hey, me and my wife had a huge argument. I never post that on Facebook. But oh, when we go out to a romantic dinner, I'm taking pictures and being like, woo, I love my honey. I always love her. But I'm posting that. You know, when, when things go great at work and I just got a raise, I'm posting that on Facebook. When we have Facebook church, where we only want people to see the good side. But that's not what church is about. You need to know, here it is, if you're church, I'll just let you know, I'm probably the most imperfect of all of us. Actually, we're all equally imperfect. But, you know what? We try to hide that. But the thing is, though it's the very thing that's the testimony, that's the very thing that God sees being burned up. You know, it also brings to the story of Jacob's limp. You know, Jake, that, that, you know, Jacob wrestled with the angel and had his hip touching and put his hip out of sight. This is a preach. This isn't my sermon, but puts his hand on his hip and dislocates his hip. From that moment on, he walked with a limp. We try to hide our limps. But actually, that was the very thing that was his testimony, what God had done in his life. You're going to hear that preach sometime. But the reason I said that was, I'd like us just to sing this song one more time, but realize that, hey, when you sing this song, you're saying, in essence, I'm at a safe place. Lord, you can show my imperfections and then consume them in front of everybody else so the world sees I'm different. I'm changed. I'm, I'm not the same thing I was or the same person that I was. I've been transformed by the fire of God. But that means that you're real. You take off your mask. You come and you're real with God. We're real with each other. Don't worry, we're not judging you. And we're going to let him burn the imperfections in our lives. We're going to let the fire, the all-consuming fire, Amen. burn. Yes. Amen? Amen? Lord, as we sing this song... Lord, we just come, we say, Lord, you have it all. Come and burn the imperfections in our lives. Lord, I've been so busy hiding my imperfections and hiding my shortcomings that we haven't even allowed you to have them. We haven't even allowed you to work with them. We've been so busy hiding maybe mistakes or failures in our lives when in reality, those failures are the place that you show yourself the biggest. And Lord, we can just be ourselves. We can come and say, yes, hello, my name's Josh. I've failed a lot. But God has blessed me in spite of myself. Lord, we thank you. And we sing the song saying, Holy Spirit, burn our imperfections. We have nothing to hide. Yes, Lord. Where we need.
Kings and Lord of Lords. Holy, 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 holy. We love you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we're going to have time again to sing and, and worship you when service is at an end, Lord. But Lord, we also thank you that your Holy Spirit's here in the room. That we've come and worshiped you and you've prepared our hearts. And now, Lord, we want to be challenged and changed. Lord, I don't want to go to church, punch a card, and leave exactly the same way. And so, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We could have the ushers come forward for a tithe and offering. I want to thank everyone who was involved in our work day yesterday, but not just there. We have a lot of people that maybe they weren't able to come for work there, weren't able to stay as long as they liked, but you may be seated. But um, they, were, they were involved. You guys have been driving work day and causing things to happen there. And I want to just thank you. As you can see, we're like one room. There's no place for children's church, no place for nursery, but December 25th, by December 25th, we'll be in that building. Amen. We'll be having service there. We'll have children's church. We'll have nursery. And um, there's a lot of other things that are going to happen in that, in that building. Chance for people to go and, and have help with resumes and do resume writing and interview skills. The opportunity to go and, and, and have a place for social workers. You know, you need to have visitation or... or, or, or um, supervised visitation and they're able to come in and at the church have a place for supervised visitation to be able to have a place that comes and, and and have the third place third place people hang out at home people go to work now we have a place that you can come have a coffee hang out have some sports on the tv what are you going to church for oh there's sports home we're going to sit down on a wednesday and watch some sports or or whenever the coffee house is open sit down and build a relationship my whole entire goal is is once we're in the new building and we're there, the first time somebody comes to church won't be the first time that they've been in the building. <laughs> we're going to offer multiple opportunities throughout the week that the church will be open and be doing things to be able to provide a way to care for our community. A place to go and, and to be there. And so um, if, we're, if you're watching online or you want to give to Issachar Church and the building, you also can text to 84 Eight four three two one. Text building or missions or what, and, and you can text to the Issachar Church that way. You can go online if you're watching online, or here today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, right now we want to thank you. Lord, I want to thank you that, Lord, my job does not provide my needs. Lord, my bank account doesn't meet my needs. You, my God, my King my Lord, my Abba Father, my Daddy God, 
you meet my needs. And so for that reason, Lord, I can be faithful. And Lord, I thank you that, Lord, we give this offering, we give this tithe as a stake in the ground, as a line in the sand that says, you're my master, you're my king, I follow nothing else but you. And your word says, where my money is, my heart will follow. And so, Lord, I desire for your kingdom, so therefore we sow into your kingdom. And Lord, we always want to remember, we don't use people to get money, we use money to reach people. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone. I, we have our welcome cards at the table if you uh, would like to fill it out for more information about the church or you have moved and you would like your information updated in the church uh, roster, that just uh, fill it out and we will take care of that for you. Um, right now, we're in the middle of five months of compassion. Our um, next picnic is the 29th of this month. Uh, we were able to talk to a lot of people. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago when we had our picnic. So we are going to do it again this month. And it's a pitch-in. We're going to have hot dogs and just the time to hang out. The young people played, and us old people, I guess, played football and everything else. So it was a, it was a good time. So the 29th after church, we're going across the street to have our picnic pitch-in. And then also, also, as Pastor Josh was saying, uh, our next work day will be August 4th that we are calling it Operation Main Street. And I'm, it's so exciting. I can actually walk into our future coffee house and not fall into the dirt. So it is exciting. We got a lot done. Um, we're still doing a lot of stuff for the upstairs with children's department. And um, Frank is uh, almost done with the men's bathroom. We actually have water in the building. It was so weird, I turned on the sink and there was clear water and it flowed and it was nice and it was cold. And it's so exciting. So everything is coming together. Um, also, we need to pray for Jacob. He is still in basic. So um, Caleb has his address. It's very important that we write him and, and let him know that we are praying for him. When is he gonna be back? Sometime in August. of August, supposedly. Okay, 23rd of August, so we need to keep Jacob in prayer. He's at basic right now. And then um, raise your hand if you have some sort of illness going on. Because Marzella, she's still healing from her broken ribs. Um, you know, there's a lot of people under the weather. Brandy, she has sinus issues that she needed surgery on. So you know what, there's just a lot going on. So let's just raise our hands. Louise's arm is still healing, and let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you in the name of Jesus. As wherever these people are, if they're in this room or they're raising their hands and they're sitting, interceding for someone, Lord, that they are healed. That as you died for us, so we could be healed. And I just thank you for that, that from the head to the toe, that we are healed in the name of Jesus that Brandy's sinuses are cleared up, Louise's arm is healed, that Marzella is able to breathe, and I just thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. When your church's vision leaks, you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you throw things. When you throw things, 200-year-old stained glass breaks. When the 200-year-old stained glass breaks, you get fired. When you get fired, your schedule clears up. When your schedule clears up, you take up a new hobby. And when you take up a new hobby, you wake up in the hospital with amnesia. Don't wake up in the hospital with amnesia. Don't let vision leak. <laughs> Don't let vision leak. Don't have Pastor Josh wake up with amnesia. Get a hold of the vision. <laughs> so um, you guys need to know, right now, where are you, where are you guys sitting? You're going to say church in a pew, in a very uncomfortable pew. This is phase two. That's where we cut this location. The reason we've called it that is don't get attached to this building. This is phase two. Our final goal and our final location is Main Street. Then this will become the Young Adult Center. 
where we'll have service and the young adults, I'm willing to, Caleb already said, yeah, the first thing we're doing is we're selling pews. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, that sounds like a fundraiser to me. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have a young adult center and they're going to have this building for them. That'll be the young adults building that they can come and worship God and have a great service here. And then we have Main Street. And so, and as I already shared some of the, some of the vision, um, one of the other things we're going to be offering is financial literacy classes. Or somebody can come in. You know, you'd be shocked on how many calls I get on a weekly basis, monthly basis for finance or financial help. And hey, are you in a good church? No, but I'm looking for one. <laughs> and so um, we get to offer financial literacy or financial help classes on how what to do. And so um, the past three weeks, we've been actually going over and we did our, our series on generosity, and that ended last week, where we talked about generosity and. I've been accused of, of talking a lot about money, and Pastor Josh talks a lot about money. But here's the reason why. And I look at money, I believe differently. Here's why. Many churches, many people in general, our culture teaches us, we use people to get money. Isn't that what our pretty much works? You're employed so they can make money. And we use people to get money. That is not our heart and our desire here. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says to use your worldly resources to reach people. So yes, we believe that we use money to get people, not people to get money. And today we're going to start a very important series. As we already talked about over the last three weeks, and if you weren't here, you can see them online, that um, the Old and New Testament, the Bible, tells every person on the planet what to do with the first 10% of their income. You can go look at it. It's not an Old Testament. It goes before the Old Testament, and it goes throughout the Bible. And so, now we'd like to talk about, Lord, do you say anything about the other 90%? And that's the series we're talking about, the other 90. And um, I bet you'd be amazed at how much the Bible has to say about money. And if you wanted a title of this message, the title of this message, I thought I'd just beat you to the, to the, to the statement. And I thought I'd just beat what everybody's already thinking, and I'd just title it my message. Pastor, mind your own business. That would be the title of my sermon today. Mind your own business. Um, and maybe that'll be a little clearer as we get, get, get going. But Proverbs 22, verse 7. And how many of you get notes? If you got notes, they're there. If not, we can give you some. If you'd like to have notes, stick your hand up. And we can make sure you have some. But there's some fill in the blanks in the scripture. Because I want to make sure that you understand Pastor Josh isn't making this stuff up. I'm showing you what the scripture says. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now that word servant, that word servant is actually ebed. That word servant means ebed, and it means slave. It means bondage. If you're in, in debt, you're a slave to bondage. The vast majority of Americans are in financial bondage. And we are slaves to our finances. How do you know you're in financial bondage? Well, I have a few questions. Don't answer them. Just think to yourself. Have you, have you ever felt like God has called you to do something or given you a mission, but you couldn't because of money? That's called the bondage. Have you ever had it break, it break again? You know, your car, your AC, your washing machine, your refrigerator, whatever it is, you can't keep up. And you can't afford to fix it. That's bondage. You know, hey, we want to get married, but we don't have enough money. That's bondage. I'd love to tithe or even give but I just can't afford it. That's bondage. Have you ever, we want to have, we have two kids, we want to have more, but we can't afford it. Well, first of all, nobody can ever afford kids, but that's bondage. Um, my wife and I would give anything to be home with our, you know, my wife and I would give anything to be home with our kids, but we don't have a choice. We both have to work. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with both people working, but I'm saying, wouldn't it be great if we were financially free? We're, could stay home. Mom or dad. A parent could stay home with their kid. 
The borrower is ebed, or slave to the lender. Bondage. Now I already know the series will not make the most popular pastor's list for me. But I told you for a long time, I've never heard anybody speak about what to do with the other 90%. And I am shocked on the amount of, money, amount of scripture there are about the 90%. But yet we always hear sermons on the 10%. Now, we preached the series on generosity. And there's a lot of ways to be generous and a lot of places you are to be generous too. And you shouldn't just give because there's a need. If you want to go look at that, that series is online. You can look at it. Just because there's a need is not a good enough reason to give. Also, if a pastor sits there and tries to convince you to give, you probably shouldn't. The Bible says give as you have purposed in your heart. And the question of obedience, Gene and I come to church already knowing what we're giving. Because it says, as you purchased, purposed in your heart. You already know. So, we covered that. You can go watch it online. It's on our website. But, we already know, you know, but, but I'm convinced we need to hear what God says about money. See CNN, Fox News, your boss, People around the water cooler, they all talk about money for good reason. You want to know why? You want to know what's really scary? The average American spends $1.22 for every dollar that they earn. That's scary. No wonder our government is a trillion dollars in debt. Or 14 trillion, I think was the last time I checked. It's probably more. Just to give you an idea, okay? I once did the calculations, just an exact. You want to know how much a trillion seconds is? If you did a trillion seconds, you'd be before the dinosaurs. We can't even comprehend a trillion seconds. You know, a million, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of seconds. A billion, that's a lot, a lot. A trillion, we can't conceive it. The world hasn't been around for a trillion seconds. And and, and so, somebody better teach us about money because we're learning it from all the wrong places. And so the fact is we've learned about money all of our lives, but most of us have learned from the wrong sources. Actually, God has a lot to say about money. And in church, most of the time we hear about the 10%. Did you know 66% of God's parables were about money? 66%. Over half. One in ten verses. If you pull out ten verses out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they talk about money. One out of ten. There are over 2,300 verses in Scripture that deal with money. That's five times more than prayer and five times more than faith. Maybe a topic we should cover in church, you think? So if we are people of the word, how many of you say that we're Bible people? How many? I'm just going to let you know, I'm not asking this one because I'm the pastor, I get to say so. We're a Bible church, okay? The Bible is the answer to what we deal with. It'd be really a shame for you to come to Issachar Church. The reason Issachar has its name 1 Chronicles 12.32. The tribe of Issachar knew the days they lived in and knew what must be done. So it would be a really shame for you to come to Issachar Church and not leave here knowing what the Bible says about how to deal with something today. Because we know the days we live in. We know what must be done. It would be very sad if we are word people and the word has so much to say about money and how to manage it then how do we get in the same mess that most Americans are in that don't go to church or crack a Bible? Well, we have some big problems, and today I just want to share with you some of those problems, and for the rest of this month, we're going to address them. Big problems. We believe lies. We believe lies. I'll give you a couple. I mean, there's so many financial lies out there. They're the opposite of what the Bible teaches, but we believe them. Worse yet, we're living under bondage because of these lies that we believe. How many of you want your kids to be better off than you? Show of hands. How many of you say, I want my kids to be better off than me? 
Lie number one. I deserve a better life now. Lie number one. I deserve a better life now. Here's the issue. The problem is our kids are getting married at 25. Right, Hannah? We're not getting married before 25, right, Elizabeth? So, we get married, say, 25. Definitely after out of college. Right, girls? <laughs> so, sorry, I had to take a chance. But we are uh, 25 to 30. Are we getting married? And they want to be where you as their parent is. After 30, days of, after 30 years of work, they believe they should be there at 20. <laughs> My parent is 50 and has worked for 30 years straight, but I should have the same things at 20. Because nobody explained to them, I, I was guilty of that. My parents had all this. And it didn't click to me until a few years later that, wait a minute, they were... 60 when that happened. <laughs> they were a lot older and had worked toward that a lot longer. But we, you know, hey, this is something you have to work toward. So what happens is we haven't taught our kids about, hey, you, it takes time to get someplace and you won't have it immediately. But they decide that's what they need to be and where they need to be, so they do it with debt. They go into debt to be able to reach the level of success because, like it or not, you're the measuring block for where your kids believe they should be. Or at least where they should start. We want my ceiling to be my kid's floor, right? So they use debt to try to reach that. And this huge crushing debt will be able to live like their parents are 30 years after a hard work and savings. They get debt so they can try to skip the 30 years of hard work and savings. Lie number two. There are certain things I cannot be happy without. Some people honestly believe, Gina, plug your ears. Plug your ears. You can't hear me, right? I'm serious. You've got to plug your ears. I'm not moving forward until you plug your ears. Oh, man. I'll skip that point then. Um, no. Don't hold this against me. I don't have to have a big screen TV to be happy. It'd be nice to have one. But I don't need one to be happy. <laughs> you, know, you know what? Some people honestly believe they have to have a flat screen, high def TV or they can't be happy. Now, I don't know what they did 10 years ago before those TVs came out. You know, the funny thing is, the things we must have to make us happy didn't even exist a few years ago. High def TV, iPhone 10, cool new phone. How did people live fulfilling lives before cell phones? I tell my daughter, you know, when, when I was in the army, we didn't have cell phones. <gasps> We got our first cell phone at what, 25, 26? No, it wasn't that much. I was 20s. How did people live fulfilled lives 15 years ago? Lie number three you have to have a car payment. Drive the one you have till the wheels fall off, and then put new wheels on it. <laughs> Transmission goes out. Oh, I got to get a new car. Transmission went out. But you know what? For three months payments, you could get a new transmission. <laughs> so, so, you know, but we have some lies that we have. And there's millions of lies that we've, we've, we, we have bought, and I just picked out a couple. But stop believing these lies, and we've got to get to a place where we're not living under bondage. You know, where we come home and open up the mailbox, and I got a new credit card. Praise God. No, God did not send you the credit card. I promise you, he didn't. Throw it away. This stuff makes me mad, and I'm sick, to, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of watching God's people hurting, fighting, miserable because of financial bondage. You know, is anybody else mad about it? Let me see your mad face. See, there, see, see the problem is, that was a really bad mad face. But the problem is, is most of us aren't mad about it. But when you get into the place that you realize, wait a minute. This is the point when God really hit me. And maybe you're not mad about it because you haven't come to the point that the scripture use your worldly resources to reach the lost. It doesn't mean that I, we already talked about this, that hey, money comes to me so it can go through me. I'm taken care of. I'm not saying live in poverty. I don't live in poverty. 
But I'm saying when I realize this, wait a minute, if we're in financial bondage, this is affecting how we reach the lost. This is affecting how we go and we, we reach people for Christ. That's the problem. It's just normal. Student loan payments are normal. Credit card payments are normal. House payments are normal. Applic uh, appliance payments are normal. Car payments are normal. And I'm just sick of normal. Or better than that, I'm mad about normal. And so I try, I, I try, I'm, tried, I'm tired of seeing the church of God or Jesus' body hurt financially. And I don't believe that's God's answer. And so, first key thought. You ready? God has given you a business. How many of you have a business? Okay. I'm, are you ready? Actually, everybody raise your hand. We all have a business. God has given us a business. You have a business. I, I've listed in, my note, in, in the notes that you have a couple of parables I'd like you to read later. I'm not going to read them. It's the steward of the manager, Luke chapter 16, 1 through 13, and the story of the, the, the parable of the steward, Matthew 25, 14 through 13. The basic premise of these is that God owns it all. Yes, do we agree God owns it all? Yes. My business is managing his assets. My business is managing the assets God's given me. I will do it well. He will give me more. You ready? This is the part everybody has an issue with. If I do it poorly, I won't have more to do. I will, ha I will lose what I have, and I won't be given more to manage. That's it. In the end, there will become a day of judgment from God concerning what I've done with his assets. If you ever get to the place where you see your finances as God's business, it will radically scare you. And it will radically change the way you handle your money. My money is God's, it is my job to manage God's assets. And that's what he's put in my account. No matter how small it is, no matter if I have enough or if I don't have enough. Who does the majority of business, why does, you want to know why the majority of business fails? Anybody have an idea of why the majority of businesses fail? Lack of planning. Majority of businesses have something that came up that they didn't plan for. J.C. Penney, do I need to tell you what store he founded? J.C. Penney, the founder of J.C. Penney's, said, give me a store clerk with a goal and I'll give you a person who will change the world. But give me a person without a, without a goal, and I'll show you a store clerk. We're going to work on a plan, and, and this, the whole entire series is going to be help you plan on how you manage your assets and your business. We're going to work on a plan and, and, and some goals. Proverbs 25 verse, or 21, verse 5. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans. Everybody say plans. plans. The plans of, a, of the diligent lead to profit. As surely as the haste leads to poverty. Plans. You have plans. That's what matters. What is your personal business plan? Do you know that you are working someone else's business plan? Everyone in this room is working someone else's business plan. You're working your business plan. You're working your banker's business plan. You're working your salesman's business plan. You're working your credit card company's business plan. Whoever you went and bought your new car from, you're working their business plan. You need to find and work your plan. And there's two steps. Get a plan, work the plan. What's your vision? What is God calling you to be about? Let me give you an illustration. Maybe this will help. Let's say you had the ability and you were offered a job in a different city, okay? You're offered a job in a different city, basically doing the same work you're doing now. And that first job is going to offer you an extra $120 a year. $120 a year for you to move to a different city. Do the math, that's $10 a month. How many would you say I'm moving to the new city for an extra 10 bucks a month? No, okay. None of you are going to say, I'm all in, woohoo, 10 bucks a month. No one's jumping at that, right? Okay, let's make it interesting. 
What if you got an extra hundred and or uh, uh, one thousand two hundred dollars a year? Now that's real. You know, now we're now we're getting some real money. A hundred bucks extra a month, an extra hundred dollars extra a month. How many would you say? I think it might. I might be a taker for that and move to a new city for an extra hundred a month. No one yet. Okay, let's go a little higher. This is going to be where we, it's going to be tough to say no. Twelve thousand dollars extra a year. She's already got her arm up. Twelve thousand extra a year. No, that's not a hundred a month. Not twelve hundred. Twelve thousand extra a year. Okay, now we have some takers. That's a thousand extra a month. At a thousand extra a month, what could you do with it? How much would you say? How many would you say for twelve grand a year? I think I'm moving to a new city. Twelve thousand a year. There's some takers. Okay. You ready? You guys should have held out. You should have held out, okay? I'm about to offer you big bucks. <laughs> so what if I could offer you now, check this out, 120K, 120,000, that's 10 grand a month. You're well into six figures. 120,000. How many of you are saying, bye bye baby, I'm gone. 120,000 a year. I'm out of here. I'm moving. Whatever you're doing now. And you're, and you're, and you're like, I'm done. I'm out. Whatever, whatever. 120,000 a year, whatever you're doing right now. Good? Does that work? Are, are, are we moving? So, okay. Got a question for you. About two months ago, I was offered the, about a month ago, I was offered the opportunity of a lifetime to do IT work in, in, for the Department of Defense in, in Virginia. Moved to Virginia, do uh, Department of Defense, and um, it was over $200,000. How many of you think I should resign and take the job? <laughs> I'm not telling a story. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not making this up either. It was... They, they told me they'd give me, it was 120 an hour plus 25,000 or 2,500 a week for expenses. You still tied this. <laughs> <laughs> you tied this to the church, the building fund's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, bigger responsibility, bigger opportunity. Needless to say, I'd keep, I, I, I'd renew my security clearance, which means big bucks and make more opportunity for the future. Every dang thing down the way, it was quite the opportunity. I learned a lesson a while back, though, because I was faced with that one other time, and I made the wrong decision. And I moved to a place called Sarajevo, Bosnia, for a few years for money. And I learned that while we're talking about money, all money ain't God money. Good money ain't God money. <laughs> There's a difference. And we could go into different topics, but I'm not going anywhere. I didn't even think about it. I was like, we kind of joked about it for a couple minutes, but they didn't get a second phone call. They didn't get a second opportunity. I'm happy with my family. My family is happy where we are. My daughters are like, dude. Um, <laughs> Jesus said you can't have two. You can't love money and God. We need to be driven by God, not by dollars. Amen. And I, I understand if, if God's told you to go somewhere and offers more money, great, that could be God providing that opportunity. I'm not saying it's just because you go, it's because of money. But this is why it's so important to have your vision. Because without a vision, you end up in Syria or Bosnia for three years. This is why you need a vision. Because then your vision makes your decision for you, not your job. Tell me a little more about, let me tell you a little bit more about, about Gina and I's vision. Money is never the object of our ministry. If so, we're really doing it wrong. <laughs> um, money is not the object of our, mission, of our ministry. Always let my heart speak, not my wallet or my bills. So, how does that happen? We learned through doing it the wrong way that we refuse debt. We don't have any credit card debt, do we? It's all gone. <laughs> no credit card debt. We learned that like, we have no credit cards. 
<laughs> I was making sure. I was like, I don't think we have any more. We took care of it. I told you we did it the wrong way. And, and, and so, this is what's important. A vision. That's what I want to talk to you about. But sometimes you have to take care because if you're in bondage, you don't have a choice. Hey, I need to provide for my family. Well, that's what Ruth did. Right? Not Ruth. Ruth's mother-in-law. <laughs> but um, Naomi. Naomi went and... Right? I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty obvious choice for her. There's no food in Bethlehem. Which is kind of ironic. The city of bread had no bread. But... There's somebody eating great in Moab. But when she came back, the people in Bethlehem had been provided for, and her friends were all there, and she didn't look like the same person. You need to be driven by vision. I want to make sure that that's out there and you know. But once you've taken care and you've taken care and you're not in debt, you're not in bondage. You can give more, and it's a blessing. I've never made a dollar that we, we, we shared our story with you on our during generosity about being able to tithe and what got, broke the, the place for us. This year we'll be able to give 20, 25, 30%. And I want to raise that, but that's the purpose. And we're closing. But I want to commit, you know, we've made the commitment. We're not going to go into debt for an automobile. There's no way. I'm not going to go into debt to buy a car. We're going to pay off our last car, and we're going to start putting money in a mutual fund for an automobile. Uh, you know, our, we have a vision that we want to be debt free. Those are great visions. But what is your vision? If you have the right kind of vision, you may be a little abnormal to obtain it. Spending thirty thousand for a new car is normal. Abnormal is saving thirty thousand. It's normal to buy a house you can't afford. Abnormal is buying a house and not including all of your income, so therefore, I have extra. It's abnormal to go for a smaller house than you can afford. It's normal to spend everything on you. It's abnormal to do less personally so you can be a true giver. What's your vision? Define it. Seek it. I'm not here to tell you debt is sin. I'm here to tell you debt is dangerous. House debt is wise. Business debt might be necessary, I don't know. But consumer debt will kill you. Notice what the Bible says about debt, Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing be debt of love to one another. For he who loves his, fellow, loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Wouldn't it be great to have no debt except to love the person next to you? Think about that. Imagine that. No debt but to love the person next to you. No loan payment, no credit card, no car payment. I want you to know it's possible. You can make a few good decisions over the next several years, and it's possible to be there, no matter your age, no matter anything. Can you imagine how different it would be debt-free? What would your life be like debt-free? Think about it. The bills you had was your light bill, your insurance, on. Your utilities and your insurance. This one thing can be true for you, but it's not normal. Normal is fighting, worrying, suffering, stress, panic. I don't want to be normal. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how to be weird with our money. And we're going to go through the Bible and what the Bible says about being weird with our money. Developing a cash flow plan. Find out where my money's going. And creating a budget. Planning to, to lower overhead. Planning for downtimes. Millions of American, Americans are wishing they had done this earlier. When is the best time to start saving? Yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> when is the second best time to start saving? Yeah. Now. <laughs> the best time to start planning and saving was 30 years ago. The best, second best time is now. How much do you have in savings?
Pastor, I don't know. I haven't picked up the bank and shake it. Here, how many quarters are rattling? So we're going to talk about what does the Bible say about developing investments? What does the Bible say? You know, there's two ways to make money. People make money and money makes money. Are you diligent? Are you disciplined? Are you obedient? Do you have a plan? If so, the Bible says God will bless that. We're going to talk about that. Because once you're out of debt, I'll just tell you, when you're out of debt and you have no bills, coming to church and giving 10% is laughable. It's just like, wow, you mean I can go bless family members? I can go bless people that God tells me to bless? So that's what we're going to look over as the worship team comes up. We're going to talk about how to get there. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 5. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowl. We're just going to talk about, and I mean, maybe, you, know, you can see maybe why I said, mind your own business. Well, first of all, because we talked about you have a business. Or maybe you took the other, Pastor, none of your business. Mind your own business. Whichever one, the title applies. But I can tell you if it applies to the first one, that I have a business. I need to change how I look at finances. I want to challenge you over the next month just to come and look at what the Bible says. I'm not going to throw out a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to say, here's what the Bible says. You know, what is your vision? Seek it. Embrace it. Live by it. I wasn't tempted for 30 seconds. 200, over 200,000, well over $200,000. Uh, so be in a place that actually guarantees that I'll be a millionaire. Because I'll be making... That was just the starting point. And there was bonuses and everything else. It was like, it guarantees it. There wasn't even 30 second thought. Because I have a vision. Gina and I have a vision. We seek it, we embrace it, and we live by that vision. We live by that. So right now, let's just close our eyes. Let's have prayer. Where are you right now? Motivated? Scared, concerned, ticked off because pastor's stepping into areas he shouldn't be. I think for many Christians, this is the most overlooked area of our Christian walk. How many of you would say, I need to change? Lord, I'm a Christian, I would say, but I need to change some things. If that's you, just raise your hand. We're going to pray. I'm not going to have you come down. or anything. But if you just say, Lord, right now I just commit that I'm going to look at my Lord, I have not looked at my finances and my assets as being your business. Now, Lord, I have a business of managing your assets. Lord, right now, you just see our hands up. My hand is up. Lord, that Lord, right now, just help each of us in this room to realize that our finances are not ours. They're your assets and it's our business just to manage them. I am a business owner. I manage the assets of God. Wow. <laughs> so, Lord, help us to get that mindset. The next time we look at our checkbook, to realize I'm an asset manager. That means a couple things, Lord. That's really freeing and liberating when I say I'm an asset manager. So, Lord, your light bill is struggling to get paid today. <laughs> I, need some, I need some options. And we can come to you for advice and finances where maybe we thought that that wasn't an area we'd come to. But Lord, now we understand it's your assets, so I can come to you on how to manage your assets. Lord, I pray that if it be online or if it be here at church, that Lord, we keep track of these sermons and this message on, on the other 90%. And let it change how we live our lives. Now Lord, I want to real quick talk about another kind of debt. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You need to know, as I look around, I know most of the people are all the people here. And I believe that all of you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if you've been trying and you, you just said, hey, I've strayed away. And I need Jesus Christ. You need to know, that debt, Jesus paid. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus paid that debt. That debt you're free from. 
So if you would say, hey, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, or if you're online and you've been watching this video and you'd like to say that prayer, if everybody could just repeat with me, dear Jesus, I accept the death of your son, Jesus Christ. The death he made on the cross for my sin. So therefore I can have relationship with you. I believe and I confess and my life is changed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to challenge you guys. Maybe not a popular message. Maybe not a message that you come to church and hear a lot about pastor, getting in your business, and not a real religious message. But hey, where's religion got us lately? I'd just like to encourage you. For the next month, this is what we're going to cover. Specific things on how to change your life. Immediately? No. Most of us like to come to church, have the pastor lay hands on us, maybe hit us with a Bible if we really are bad, and then miraculously everything changes overnight. Well, reality, it doesn't usually happen that way. And it definitely doesn't happen that way here. There has to be a new reprogramming and a new way of learning some things. And we're going to go over that and look at that. Let's stand and worship.
today. I hope that today you receive that the Lord wants to be involved in every area of our life. And um, it's only us who've excluded finances being one of those areas. Now, before we leave, you know, the Bible says that when we pray together, He's there in the midst of us, come together, agreeing. The problem is, is if I said right now, let's all break apart and pray, well, you might go pray for one thing over there while I'm praying here, and that's all good. But we like to leave having agreed together in prayer. And we believe here at Issa Secret Church, one of the most effective ways to pray is praying Scripture. And so you're going to have some slides pop up. And these aren't slides for you to sit there and, okay, let's hear what Josh is praying. This is for us all to pray together out loud. We aren't going to say, you don't have to re-quote it. You pray in your own words how you want to pray and what these show you. But if you say, hey, Isaiah 40, verse 12, here's what that verse reveals, and here's what our request is going to be because of that verse. It's kind of called a prayer model. And so um, I'll be the loudest, mainly because I'm a big mouth, but also because I have the mic. But it's also, so therefore you understand, where you're at, you can pray aloud. Not just pray to yourself and agree, but pray aloud so all of us are praying. And then the slides will change and go through, and we can sit there and we can be, I'm left here agreeing with Scripture and praying Scripture. So Lord, right now we want to thank you, Lord, that you are bigger than anything that faces us. Lord, in your outer dimensions, Lord, you are bigger than anything I could be facing. You're larger than any problem I could be up against. situations, but over them, through them. Lord, we thank you that we rely on your strength, not our strength, that you enjoy restoring what we've lost. We thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that when we leave here today, we'll leave here with the understanding that, Lord, it is my business to run your assets. What a huge responsibility that we, Lord, accept it and change the outlook of our finances. In Jesus' name, amen.